We're now live on YouTube. I'll get the presentation started.
So good morning everybody, I'm Councillor Jason Smithers, leader of North Northamptonshire Council and it gives me absolute pleasure to welcome you to our second North Northamptonshire Climate Conference. I am very pleased we have such a vast array of speakers this year that help demonstrate some of the great work that is going on in this important area and will also help inform and educate all of us how we can play our part in reducing carbon emissions in our daily lives. The climate change we are facing is caused by our behaviours and the way we use the limited resources available to us. It's not as bad as you think though, it's far worse. We have all experienced the record warm temperatures of New Year's Eve last year. The scorching summer temperatures that topped 40 degrees Celsius for the first time in our recorded history and most recently the above average autumn temperatures of November. Since 1998, we have also weathered six of the 10 wettest years on record. Climate modelling shows that if our climate was unaffected by human influence, it's virtually impossible for temperatures in the UK to reach 40 degrees Celsius. 100 weather stations reported snow laying on the ground in December. Winters are also getting warmer with less snow falling. Some may ask, what is wrong with warmer winters? Well, whilst it may be refreshing, it also means that summer months will be even hotter than ever. This will bring disruption to our way of life, affecting our food supplies, our sources of water, and the businesses that we do both locally and nationally. We need a new way to behave, a new way to live our lives that is more environmentally sustainable in our communities. We need to adopt a more sustainable way of living, a local area with clean air, clean water and clean transport and clean energy. When we also think of including healthier soils and habitats, you start getting a clearer view of the scope of our vision for healthier communities in our local areas. At North Northamptonshire Council, we are committed to working together with our local communities to help prepare and implement plans together across the vast range of measures to continue this challenging work ever more fervently. To realise the goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. We all realise that we need to drive up efficiency and cut energy demand, increase renewable energy resources to supply most of our power, electrify all forms of transportation where we can and get fossil fuels out of our buildings over a sustainable time frame. Achieving these goals will require sustained coordinated policy efforts from all levels of government, the private sector and our local communities. I believe that with the proven demonstrated clean energy technologies and resources that we have today, all of those new technologies and importantly behaviours that are emerging together with our collective own can-do attitude North Northamptonshire has, we can rise to the challenge ahead. With this aim in mind, I am delighted to officially open this year's Climate Change Conference and will now hand over to Councillor Harriet Pentland, our Executive Member for Climate and Green Environment and also your host for today. Welcome to the NNC Climate 22. Good morning everyone and thank you to Councillor Smithers there for that welcome to NN Climate 22. As you just heard, I'm Councillor Harriet Pentland and I'm the Executive Member for Climate and the Green Environment at North Northamptonshire Council. It's good to be back with our second climate conference, providing us with the opportunity to further discuss the response to tackling climate change locally. I'd like to start by thanking everybody who's involved today for their participation. As I said last year, it's really important to me that people are aware and involved with what is going on locally in respect of climate change. It doesn't feel to me that it's been a year since COP26 took place in Glasgow, but it has, and the world has changed in many ways since then. COP27, which has taken place um, in Egypt, opened on the 6th of November, with the key aim of ensuring the full implementation of the Paris Agreement. The significant aim of the Paris Agreement, which was signed in 2015, was to keep global temperature rise this century to well below two degrees Celsius. 
with efforts to further limit this to 1.5 degrees Celsius. 2021 gave rise to the phrase to keep 1.5 degrees alive, as you may remember. At COP27, the president-elect of Brazil spoke to say that the country would restore the Amazon rainforest, and China has indicated a preference for an agreement with wording similar to that of last year. Closer to home, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak MP said that it was morally right for Britain to honour its climate change commitments in his speech at COP27, as well as highlighting the potential for and importance of new jobs and clean growth, which resonates with what you'll hear from a number of the speakers today. We'll find out more on Friday of the outcomes um, of the conference, which I'm sure we'll all um, be interested to hear about. But for today, we're bringing things closer to home here in North Northamptonshire. The purpose of this conference, as I mentioned, is to highlight the positive work being done locally in looking after the environment and tackling climate change, and to also understand a bit more about what is happening in terms of climate locally. I hope that some of the information you hear today may inspire you in your day-to-day -day life. Last year, I spoke of the role your local council has in tackling climate change. And this is a good opportunity for me to quickly highlight what North Northamptonshire Council has been doing since we held NN Climate 21. As a council, we have pledged to become carbon neutral by 2030. And as part of this commitment, there is one million pounds in the budget, which has been committed to starting to tackle this. Our carbon management plan for the council, which goes into great detail of the data around our, our carbon emissions, is in its final stages and will soon be being followed um, through with the actions on the ground. Carbon literacy training has been undertaken by many councillors and officers across the authority and has been really useful in understanding the challenges that we face. Since April 2022, 4, 000, over 4,000 trees have been planted in North Northamptonshire and a further 1,200 will be planted by March 2023. 23 on-street EV charging points have been fitted so far, and this is a fantastic start, but there are many, many more in consultation to ensure that we get the infrastructure out there. As part of the Homes for the Future programme, North Northamptonshire Council and the previous sovereign authorities have retrofitted over 200 homes to make them more energy efficient. Voy scooters, which are across North Northamptonshire, have been used for over 500,000 trips, saving over 87,000 kg of CO2. And the little starship robots that you're seeing pop up um, have saved over 9,000 vehicle miles and serviced over 30,000 households. So that's just a snapshot of what has been going on, the highlights, so to speak, and much more is going on behind the scenes as well. We hope that by bringing together individuals from across North Northamptonshire leading on the green agenda, we'll give you an insight into the work going on on your doorstep and the opportunities for moving forward at this crucial point in time. So we'll now move to session one, and the theme for this is looking forward. Um, and I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, uh, which is Dr. Janet Jackson, an ecologist and senior lecturer in geography and environmental sciences at the University of Northampton. So over to you and thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so there might be a biography somewhere um, that tells you that I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Northampton. And um, if you could just move this, the slide forward, sorry, so the rest of the slide is visible. Thank you. And again, that's it. Lovely. Um, so, yes, I've been a senior lecturer. Uh, I've been lecturing um, at the university for over 20 years now. Um, I'm an ecologist. Um, I don't really, um, I don't really have a particular specialism in an organism, but I have uh, an all-round um, ecological knowledge, and I've been researching uh, biodiversity values and also community participation in 
in, in the environment and improving biodiversity over many years. So today really is, is about reflecting that experience and, and really thinking about, you know, we, we know a lot of stuff about ecology and biodiversity and, and how do we get that out there in the community and get everyone involved in, in helping to protect what we have and maybe create opportunities for, for struggling wildlife. So next slide, please. So my first, well, my first influence really was reach it, you know, reading Rachel Carlson's book in 1962. And it's the, the area of, well, I was a teenager when I first picked it up. But she was the first person really, I suppose, to, to write a popular science book that reached a huge audience of people. And it created this uprising of environmental consciousness about what um, man-made products can do to the environment. So famously, this is all about DDT, and it's a it's, it's, it's a, a type of um, insecticide that actually bioaccumulates in 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 your body uh, and in the body of animals as well and birds. And there's, there's, the warning signs came out when top predators began to suffer, particularly um, birds of prey, where they were at the top of the food chain, accumulating. Uh, the chemicals associated with GDT. And so um, what was happening is those populations were crashing because the, the, the shell of the eggs was so thin they couldn't hold their offspring. The next slide, please. So um, this is a book that's been around for a little while, but it's an interesting one because this is Connor Jameson's perspective of that period and up to current state of today um, in the UK rather than the American view of um, Rachel Carson. So it's, it's an interesting one because he was actually working with the RSPB and they were getting dead bodies of birds, you know, arriving at Sandy Lodge and people saying what's going on with these birds. They were literally dropping off their perches in the 1970s. And um, so, you know, it's, he ends up with quite a positive message about, as a general rule, astonishing powers of recovery nature has. Um, if we stop killing it, if we stop doing the bad stuff, it can recover. And I've always been an optimist in, in my sort of study of the environment, thinking that if we can change things, change people's mindsets, you know, things could get better and quite quickly. However, you know, some bits are more difficult to recover and species generally um, that are, you know, quite limited in their distributions, you know, associated with historical artifacts of past land use, they're more tricky. But generally, um, you know, if you, if you build it, they'll come, as RSBB used to say. Next slide, please. So this is a just a lesson to us all, really. This is a paper that I showed my students this year, um, just being published, South African study, looking at um, the presence of DDT in animals. And here we've got um, the cow and cow um, from South Africa. And 100% of the samples they, they took from um, these animals contained PCBs in their tissues and 83% of them had DDT. Now, DDT is still an important um, tool, I suppose, in controlling malaria, um, but it's also known to stay in the environment for a very long time. It, it doesn't really break down very easily, and it will remain in soils and, and sediment deposits. And uh, so that's, you know, worrying. You know, we still have a cleanup to do in some to some extent. Next slide, please. So if we th if think about um, the research my um, colleague Jeff Ollerton has done over many years, looking at bee populations, unique interactions between flowers and pollinators, and 23 species of bee wasps have disappeared from the UK since 1850. And people think about bees and they suddenly think associate with honeybees. We're not talking about honeybees, we're talking about native bees. These can be solitary bees, bumblebees, 
And there's a whole variety of native species that many people don't realise. And, you know, even butterflies are struggling. And, and, you know, I've noticed it this year. And there was a recent study where somebody was asking about insects hitting window screens. And I remember as a child, you know, my dad's car that, you know, would go on a, a summer drive and the car would be absolutely covered in insects. Whereas today, nothing, absolutely nothing is, you know, appearing on my windscreen. I don't know about anybody else. Next slide, please. And of course, if we lose our pollinators, we're starting to see low productivity in our pollinated crops, you know. And as a surprise, this is just a short list, really, but gives you an idea of how much of our food supply is actually dependent on those insects to pollinate them. And, um, you know, I like to do a bit of gardening. It's been tricky here with all the, you know, the heat and the water shortage, you know, my rainwater butts, you know, ran out quite quickly this year. These erratic changes in weather um, is, and, and climate change is a real risk. It's a real risk because we can end up with flowers flowering at the wrong time and insects emerging and missing those pollinating. Well, they're not, they don't want the flowers to pollinate. They need the nectar resources to feed on. That keeps them the energy they need. They're just pollinating by accident, really. But if those nectar resources aren't available at the right time when insects populations are emerging, then you know, we've got a desynchronization. And another potential is that when those insects are emerging and they're not doing so well, you know, that's the same time that birds start fledging, you know, nests, young birds are fledging from their nests and they need those insects to mature into adults. Next slide, please. OK, so, yeah, it's not just about chemicals and, you know, the climate. We've done quite a lot of other stuff as well to change the landscape and land use. And I probably don't need, you don't need me to, to preach about all this. It's right in front of us. We've lost a lot of habitat over the last 70 years. Next slide, please. So the big message for today is that we can't stand by and watch this happening anymore, really. Um, do we want more species to go extinct? Not just in the UK, but our consumer habits around the world is also impacting, you know, wildlife in, in, in devastating ways. And there's a sort of bit of science here, really, in terms of the theoretical concepts, is that there's a critical threshold and things might seem OK outside. You know, you can hear the odd blackbird singing and things, but there is this critical threshold when resources get so poor and, you know, those um, pressures against um, species and habitats is so strong that that resilience is much more difficult to 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 instigate really or to recover. Next slide, please. So, what does resilience mean? And um, really, it's it's it. Our resilience is really dependent on the ecosystems around us and the wildlife as well as I just hinted about, you know, food security. And, you know, what benefits um, we get from the environment are sometimes very difficult to measure. People have been trying to measure ecosystem services, but, you know, when you start looking at microorganisms in soils, um, looking at the interest it sees about health and well-being and how we respond to our environment, that's very, you know, much more difficult to measure. It's more sort of intrinsic, really. But it's there, it benefits us, and we need to perhaps remember that and act on it really as well. Next slide, please. So I worked um, at a, a development site in Upton, the, the Western Northampton. Uh, in 2003, I started doing some research there. I was interested in the landscape ecology, the connectivity of wetlands and river um, organisms and plants. Um, being in these um, new wetland environments that have been built as a result to mitigating flood um, risk. And uh, so um, surprisingly, you know, I said earlier, build it and they will come. These, these wetlands and ponds um, were colonised rapidly and we had some, you know, red later species. We had um, reed buntings, you know, grass snakes. Um, county rarities of dragonflies and, and 
all sorts, all sorts of wonderful things but very quickly. And so we can build this resilience into our developments. We can retrofit it as well, where we've got space, where we've got green infrastructure. We can retrofit these systems that will not only give us resilience to flood risk and climate change, but also resilience to biodiversity. And biodiversity, again, is a big thing at the moment because it's been written into legislation. But what does that actually mean? How do you measure mycorrhizal growth in soils and, you know, um, interactions with pollinators? And how do you know those, those are increasing? Next slide, please. So I suppose the lessons learned from Upton was that we have um, evidence, really, of these natural green elements, green fingers, that need very little management, very little money spending on them, but they're functioning in bioremediation, sediment control, nutrient uptake, reducing all that impact on the river. Next slide, please. And also um, around the world, I've, I've been a part of the International Association for Landscape Ecology for many years, and there's lots of exi exciting examples that have been demonstrated for over 20 years now. And if you look at the topic of restoration ecology, landscape ecology, there's lots of examples. It's only about our imaginations, really, that's putting us back. Next slide, please. And in terms of restoration, we've got examples here in the UK of really successful reintroductions. The red kite is probably the most famous one, and the otter as well. Um, we have, I don't know whether you can call Highland cattle reintroductions, but it's a reintroduction of land use, really, or land management. And also, similarly, the, the beaver as well, just adding those dynamic um, landscape factors that help restore sort of opportunities for biodiversity. Next slide, please. So, OK, where are we now? Um, well, how do we value our green spaces and biodiversity? It's tricky. I think, you know, a lot of people just think it's there and it's OK, you know, and we'll just soldier on. Um, but next slide, please. Um, I think people don't understand that you have to invest in biodiversity. You have to invest in community engagement, community well-being. The quality of landscapes that we're living in, they, they need investment as much as, you know, anything else in our daily lives. Next slide, please. So I, I just quickly went back in time again. I found this many years ago in Northampton Library. It's a beautiful hand-painted, hand-typed Northampton development plan. And this is a time where there were slums, there was poor sanitation. But even then, people were thinking about um, the environment, the homes and environment of the people, where people lived and their landscapes. And that included parks and open spaces, the transport, means of communications, markets, social centres. You know, this is all, I suppose, it's all um, coming from uh, maybe the, the Garden City movement and the arts and crafts and where the value of the quality of landscape we live in was precious and, and there. Next slide, please. And here in that document is actually what I consider is the first green space strategy for Northampton, 1925. Next slide, please. So um, this is a project that I was involved with a few years ago with Fiona Fife, where we looked at green spaces around Northampton identified different characteristics of green space and also landscape character as well of looking at how we can connect um, habitats and landscape values together more cohesively around our green infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, I don't know where that, if that project is now because of you know, the changes in the utilitarian um, divisions, but um, hopefully we can, you know, pick that up um, in both West North Hans and North North Hans and, and expand that principle of looking forward to seeing how we could invest in green infrastructure. Next slide, please. So the next thing is who's in charge? 
Um, so yeah, I work with community groups quite a lot, and they're going well. You know, we need the need the government to do this, and we need our local authorities to do that. And lots of uh, lots of fog really is about whose responsibility it is. That happened at Upton. You know that it was um, there was a land management company that's I think there's been several of them since the start of that project. And you know, for the community to get involved, it's really difficult to know who whose permission you need. You know, can we can we take control ourselves? And that, and I think we need some clear messages really, not to be too risk averse. You know, to have community groups um, that are really invested in their landscape and we have some elements of that we've got friends of groups friends of Eastfield Park etc friends of Dedebury um, but these are put, you know spotted about the town or around the county and maybe we need a more cohesive you know um, organized um, network of community groups next slide please so the next experience really is just where we are at Northampton Waterside Campus at university. And my colleagues, like ecological colleagues and I, were invited to speak to landscape architects. And um, we managed to sort of persuade them to steer away less, the more urban style of landscaping to native species planting. So we still got quite a lot of hard surfaces, but a lot of that is porous paving. Um, but where we have the opportunity, we've got lots of willows and if I go to the next slide, I'll just show you some of the other elements. So, oh yes, um, part of part of the build is eco-friendly um, buildings, but we've got green roofs and we've got the biomass boiler too. Okay, next slide, please. And this just gives you a flavour of the native species plant thing that we, we managed to get on campus. And you might hear a bit more about the campus and innovation design um, for my colleague Vicky later. Next slide. But the staff and students have been busy since we moved in onto campus. We've been surveying, monitoring, taking data, dissertation projects. And overall, we've got this baseline of a very new landscape that's containing quite a number of species that was once a brownfield site, you know, contaminated brownfield site, if that. And then we actually got this exciting news. We had Brian Laney come um, and do a survey with us a few years ago, before COVID this was. Um, and he found a small flower catch fly. It hadn't been seen in the county for 170 years. It was thought it was extinct. And it just came out of some, you know, rough, disturbed land. You know, it could possibly be a seed bank. Maybe it was brought in by soil uh, for the development of the site but he was thrilled to pieces. So what we need then is to learn some lessons from Waterside, from our success of, you know, actually by getting biodiversity gain from that we've designed. Next slide, please. And then what we've been doing is working very closely with our estates team. Um, they've been trained to be hedgehog champions. We've been doing the University Campus Award and we're, we're hoping to submit for gold this, this December. And that's really about, you know, getting everyone involved, feeling that they have a part to play in protecting the wildlife on the campus. And we have staff projects, we have fundraising. Um, and the next slide is, is probably the one project that I'm really passionate about, but because of COVID, it got stopped in its tracks. We have all this willow and, you know, it could be a waste product, but really, actually, it's beautiful and we can do things with it. We can we can weave it. We can donate it to, you know, occupational therapy um, classes at St Andrews. We can sell it and use it as a social enterprise to fund more biodiversity projects on campus. So it's actually looking at the value, um, not just for biodiversity gain, but actually the resources that we're, we're producing could be of value too. OK, that's me done. How are I done? Great, thank you very much for going through that, Dr. Jackson. Um, really good to and interesting to hear about the PCBs and the DTTs, if I'm getting those right. Yeah. Uh, and there's quite some eye-opening information there um, around the impact on biodiversity. Um, 
important to hear about what we can do to look after biodiversity and nature and the resilience of it if we give it the opportunity to rebound. I know that's something the council is looking at very carefully in relation to our pollinator strategy, which we've got in place, and the work that's going on with the local nature recovery strategy. So thank you for going through that with us. I'm going to move to the next speaker now, and then at the end, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions of the speakers from this session. So I'm going to hand over to Nadine Lana, who is Environment and Sustainability Manager at Keir Highways. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, good morning. I'm Nadine Lana. I'm the Environment and Sustainability Manager for Kia Highways for both North and West Northamptonshire. Um, Kia were awarded the contract for providing highway services across both North and West Northants um, earlier this year, and the contract went live on the 12th of September. So uh, we're a couple of months in now. Um, so quite new, new to Northants. I um, just wanted to take this opportunity to talk through the Kia's approach to sustainability and what we are doing within highways. Next slide, please. So a bit of context around the business and our management of sustainability. Um, Kia Highways sit within the larger Kia group, um, of which there are several different business streams, including construction, utilities, infrastructure and highways. Um, so Kia Group have produced an overarching framework which sets out the high level business targets for sustainability. Um, each business stream then, due to the different nature of the works that are carried out, are given responsibility for how they will ensure the requirements within the framework are met. So for highways, we've developed um, a, strat a strategic plan for delivery called Driving for a Sustainable World. Um, and out of this framework drops our One Planet Action Plan. So throughout these slides, you'll probably see OPAP or One Planet Action Plan, which is what that refers to. Um, so each, um, the, the One Planet Action Plan, sorry, is then broken down further into the 10 principles of sustainability, which you'll see below. Each of those principles has its own plan and a working group to uh, ensure compliance and delivery of, of each of those specific targets. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a visual of how the One Planet Action Plan pulls everything together. It organizes all the aspects of sustainability um, obviously, they're all sort of separate in their own right, but then they all pull together into the One Planet Action Plan to ensure that we deliver the targets and we're all working in the same direction. Next slide, please. Okay, so this looks quite similar to the previous slide, but this shows how all of the highway contracts feed into the, the One Planet Action Plan and each contract has its own key contacts and working group um, that that work towards the, the targets. So in order to ensure consistency across the whole of highways, um, an OPAP workshop is rolled out to all new contracts um, to ensure everyone understands the principles of sustainability and that we're all wor working towards the same targets. Um, so the, work, the workshop is mandatory for all Kia staff, but is also open to our supply chain and client members. Um, following the workshop, which um, is a presentation around sustainability, what it means um, and how we can be more sustainable, there are also breakout sessions within that where people can go away and we can discuss how um, the, the principles can be brought into the contract and what we can do locally to, to drive those forward. Um, so following the workshop a working group is then set up um, and they then produce a working plan for each individual contract um, with specific targets which are obviously aligned to both the highways and the group targets next slide please so uh, when we look to define sustainability typically we look at the three pillars the economic the social and the environmental um, obviously, the three are intrinsically linked. Um, for example, without a healthy environment, you don't have healthy people. And without healthy people, you don't have a healthy business. So poor performance in any of those areas can have an impact on the others. So, you know, obviously, we're looking at a balance. Often, um, when people talk about sustainability, they were referring predominantly to the environment. 
And we need to change that mindset to get better at thinking about the bigger picture, to include all three pillars in everything that we do, in all the work that we do, in our planning and de uh, delivery. So this slide here just shows the, the 10 principles that were on the previous slide, and they've been split between environmental sustainability and social sustainability. Obviously, in reality, they overlap. Uh, for example, sustainable transport and air quality is under the social sustainability there, but there are obviously environmental implications with that. So it would cross over the, the two. Um, all of these 10 principles have an impact on economic sustainability. Um, our environmental and social performance will directly impact our ability to win work and make profits ultimately. So it just shows that the three uh, pillars are, are interlinked. Next slide, please. So uh, moving on to carbon, um, just a couple of definitions before I go into our targets. So, um, you know, we, we hear these phrases a lot and just wanted to, to define them. Um, so net zero, um, this obviously requires deep reductions in emissions. So we need to drive our emissions down as low as we possibly can um, before um, offsetting. So it's reducing them down to at least 90% and then offsetting the, the remaining uh, small amount. Um, this covers scopes one, two and three. Um, carbon neutral is balancing emissions with the amount removed from the atmosphere via offsetting. And this only covers scope one and two. So for us, our targets are to be net zero across our scope one and two operations by 2030 and to be net zero across supply chain which is scope three by 2045. Um, Kia Group are in the process of publishing an offsetting minimum standard that will provide guidance to the business around the correct use of offsetting methods. Beyond that, by signing up to with science-based target initiatives for the net zero targets, um, uh, we understand that offsetting must meet certain criteria and to be truly net zero, obviously you've got to bring down uh, your footprint by at least 90% before even considering offsetting. Next slide, please. So this is just looking at our, our performance in the recent years um, across, this is across the whole of highways. So we've, between uh, 2019 and 2021, we reduced uh, scope one emissions by 25% and scope two by 48%. Um, and we are now baselining our scope three, which includes our supply chain, waste and fuel data. Some of our, our key headline projects, we've, um, we're working with CIHT on a carbon literacy course for the sector to improve knowledge and understanding of carbon management. Um, we've submitted our science-based targets and awaiting verification of, on those. Um, certification to past 2080 is underway and certification to the Carbon Trust route to net zero has commenced. Next slide, please. So what are we doing and how are we getting these reductions? I'm just gonna go through a few of the initiatives that we are, are currently using or are ha having in place. So obviously in highways, uh, fleet and plant is, um, key to achieving our scope one and two net zero targets. We have a lot of fleet and we have a lot of plant. Um, basically, they make up about 90% of our scope one and two emissions. So um, the transition to net zero for those is key to, to meeting our targets. Um, we have a target to transition all of our fleet and plant to alternative fuels by 2030 and all of our cars and small vans will gradually transition to electric. Uh, next slide, please. So HVO is um, an alternative fuel to diesel. It's hydro-treated vegetable oil. Uh, we see this as a short-term stepping stone solution until zero carbon alternatives like green hydrogen become commercially available. Um, all our HVO that we use is purchased um, with an accompanying certificate from ISCC. 
So this um, is used as a check on its provenance to ensure it continues to meet with environmental standards. Um, HVO is currently being used in on the Northamptonshire contract. Next slide, please. So handheld plant, this is things like steel saws, chainsaws, hedge trimmers. Um, we are transitioning those over to electric throughout this year and going forward. 327 items have been identified that can be transitioned, which as you can see has a, a quite significant carbon saving. Um, and the fa phase two of this transition will be to be looking at larger items of plant that we can transition over to electric. Next slide, please. So hydrogen, um, this is uh, the, the next big step in terms of uh, energy. We anticipate obviously technologies and innovations created to address the climate crisis will probably increase exponentially over the, the duration of the contract. So um, we have trials in place with um, a, a leading um, specialist called Proteum who are looking to bring in hydrogen cells to the business as a longer term solution. Um, we're looking at developing a net zero depot, which is a fully hydrogen fueled. Um, and if that's successful, then the blueprint will be used to replicate this across sites elsewhere in the country. Um, so we're looking at that feasibility study for that within the next 12 months. Um, so that, that's exciting news. Um, and obviously hydrogen, the, the usage of hydrogen is, is huge in terms of uh, plant and vehicles and you know buildings and, and everything. So um, yeah, that's, that's exciting. Next slide, please. So by impl implementing some of these initiatives and any new technologies and ways of working along the way, we hope to see our total CO2 emissions reduce to zero by 2030. And this is the sort of timeline we're looking at. So bringing in those initiatives at various stages along the way um, and eliminating fossil fuels completely by 2030. Thank you. Next slide. So these are some of the other initiatives that are happening around the business. Um, uh, we have our Depots in Bloom uh, initiative, which uh, all depots are welcome to, to join. It's a sort of competition amongst the, the depots and they uh, use their, their time to plant, uh, plant, plant up the depot to make it look nice. But also um, many of the depots have used it very wisely in basically achieving allotment style growing where they've been growing um, vegetables and fruit and one depot even grew watermelons it's amazing so it creates a nice space for people to enjoy it's a, a nice activity for staff to get involved in and you can produce um, produce to take home at the end of the day uh, we have a single use plastic toolkit which has been launched to enable better decisions to be made around avoiding the use of single use plastics. A no idling policy on all sites and depots, obviously to reduce our emissions. Um, our sustainable travel decision tree is to encourage people to consider more sustainable options. So just one move up the tree can make a big improvement in reducing your emissions. And you know if you can do it one or two days a week when you're traveling to work, then that would make a difference. So we put it, putting the infrastructure into our depots to enable people to um, bike to work or walk to work, uh, add in showers and lockers and bike stands and that kind of thing to encourage people to, to become more sustainable in their uh, travel decisions. And the last one there is the um, OPAP scoring, sustainability scoring. So this is uh, something that's in the pipeline that we can award to depots. Um, so it's again, a bit of a competitive element there to um, show whether depot, you know, how sustainable depots are in terms of their um, operations, um, obviously aiming for a gold standard. Next slide, please. So this is quite a busy slide. I'm not gonna go through all of it, um, but just a, a few highlights. Um, we've got, 
14% of our fleet currently is now electric or hybrid. Um, we've got a, a project going with Proteum, which I mentioned earlier, to establish um, a high, fully hydrogen highway depots. That's underway currently. Um, some new exciting things on the horizon. Uh, we've been working with Aston University, looking at the potential use of biochar in construction and maintenance. So this is a, a product that's similar to charcoal, um, but it's um, produced in a, an oxygen-free environment. So whereas when you burn wooden vegetation, usually it releases carbon, um, the carbon is, because it's um, burnt within a, an oxygen neutral environment, the carbon is trapped within it. Um, and then this material can be used um, in planting schemes. It can be crushed and added to add nutrients to soil or it can be used in construction. Um, another one is Kia have partnered with Ocean Conservation Trust to grow seagrass. Um, Kia Group have sponsored the Blue Meadow project to protect and restore seagrass habitats. Now it seems a bit strange that we're sponsoring seagrass when we're on the highways, but it's great for biodiversity and has a 40 time more, is 40 times more efficient absorbing CO2 than trees are. So it, it's a great opportunity to get involved for us to um, help out and you know get get more carbon absorbed through that. Thank you. Next slide. And this is just to bring it back down to a, a local level. What are we doing here in North Northamptonshire? So um, Currently, 80% of our over three and a half ton vehicles, including the Gritters, are now operating on HVO. We have nine key plant items that have been switched from diesel or petrol over to electric, and that includes our steel saws, cat and jennies, our chainsaws, hedge trimmers, and breakers. Um, we've got depot improvements in the pipeline to reduce CO2 through energy and resource saving. So this is including things like rainwater harvesting because we wash a lot of vehicles, so that would save a lot of water, electric charging points and solar panels. Um, we're baselining the biodiversity within the highway uh, network to enable us to demonstrate net gain over the, the life of the contract. So we've got a target of 10% net gain over the, the life of the contract. Um, every tree we, we remove during our operations will be replaced and we need to demonstrate, we will be de demonstrating an increased tree coverage again over the life of the contract. So we're monitoring that, we're going to be baselining all the tree coverage um, in the next year. Um, we're adopting electric and ultra low emission vehicles for all under three and a half ton vehicles by the end of this year, uh, end of year one, sorry, which is September next year for us. And we're using warm mix asphalt as standard um, instead of the hot mix alternative, which uses considerably less emissions. And uh, that, that's just some of the key points that we are introducing into North Northamptonshire. Next slide, please. That's me done. Yeah, so um, yeah, just want to say that obviously sustainability isn't something that we should be looking at in isolation. Uh, or competing with each other on, we should be looking at it as something we need to work together on. So any new innovations, any new technologies that are out there, we need to be sharing um, so we can all work together, obviously, to a common goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine, for going through that with us and giving us that insight into what Kia is doing, um, both nationally and locally, in terms of embedding sustainability into that, which I'm sure will have been useful for members of the public and anybody watching at home to hear about. So thank okay. you. So I'm going to hand over to our third speaker and the final speaker for this session, um, Nick Bolton, who is the co-founder of Electric Places. So over to you, Nick. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as Harriet introduced, uh, my name is Nick Bolton. Um, I was the founder of uh, Electric places or originally electric Corby uh, more than 10 years ago we were essentially established to sort of drive sustainable the sort of sustainability change uh, as the area was growing rapidly 
but also importantly sort of our, our activity was founded on achieving economic prosperity and and strength as part of that change um and i think it's uh, that's a, a key message that i want to bring across in, in in my uh presentation today is that that balance between sustainability but also the the importance to to ensure a just transition and an economically robust transition so uh, that's what uh, hopefully we'll come across as, as i go through next, next slide please uh i think everybody on the call pretty much will probably or on this on this uh presentation will be very aware of the of the challenges that we face environmentally around the climate change next slide please um and they are sort of vast and complex and we've had an insight into some of them already this morning we're hearing them all the time on a daily basis um about what's going on around us we can see it looking out the window um and i think uh you know feel the uh the, the loss in biodiversity that, that janet's already talked about the floods uh across the world extreme weather and, and so forth so i think it, that is that is increasingly clear to many it's still a message that needs to be uh pushed strongly that we we face quite significant or well, very significant challenges and changes um but also uh, we 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 face a lot of economic challenges in that environmental change as well um and some economic opportunities so um i think just setting that context everybody's very clear on, on or very clear on on, on those uh, some of those challenges but really some of the opportunities that come out of this i think are, are, are often missed so next slide please um yeah, so the, the work that we've been doing most recently is really looking at, um, at how we how we st start to, to identify the actions and opportunities we can use to tackle these challenges. Government and local government are, are, are very alert to this now, obviously, and have uh, declared climate emergencies and started to put in place the policies and the reviews um, what we're now looking to see is what the actions might be so the nn to nz project the north northamptonshire to net zero is really a look at developing uh, a program of initiatives that can start to help make this transition this the, the graph on the on the right there really just shows the the change the positive change that's been happening so far going back in this instance to 2005 up to uh present day you can see that gradual reduction in lots of the the emissions from various sectors from industrial to, to transport to to public sector and so on and that's a, a broad public sector um change that's been reducing some of the initiatives that harriet and others have already already mentioned um but if we, next slide please um but actually we we have a, a lot still to do if we carry on that trend um and take it forward to 2050 we can see here that by our measure, looking just specifically at North Northamptonshire, we still have close to a two million tons of CO2 per year gap in in where we where we may achieve if we carry on in what uh, this graph shows as a steady progress, um, a study taken uh, by National Grid, looking at the changes that are going on, improvements across all sectors, but really not not fast enough. So we've been reviewing. A vast number of projects that are going on across the country and across the world to see what initiatives could really be implemented in North Northamptonshire to help speed up that change. Um, and that review, uh, as I say, is is we've been take, uh, taking through over the last the last twelve months or so. Um, next slide, please. There's been an opportunity to for everybody to chip in ideas, and that that call is still open. Although we're nearing the end of our review and analysis period, we're still very keen to hear if people have got initiatives or ideas or thoughts on how this area can take action to to make the transition to a to a net zero future. So please uh, do, do do engage with that if you get get an opportunity or have some good great ideas. Um, next slide, please. But we've been we've been looking really at a a very broad view of what what uh, we could possibly do taking a, a blue sky thinking pardon that phrase look at that everything from you know if every car park in the area had solar uh, and wind uh, installations on it if every building was fully insulated if everybody turned vegan and i should stress or vegetarian i should stress there one of the things we we're looking at is 
not everybody going fully fully vegetarian, but perhaps everybody going a little bit vegetarian and reducing our meat content. So we've been really looking at everything from infrastructure to behavioral change, to offsetting, to small scale installations, to large scale initiatives, all the different things that, that, that we could be doing. Next slide, please. And really we focused in on some emerging key areas around energy, buildings, transport, what industrial and commercial partners can do and how we transition on food, farming and, and forestry. I'm really looking uh, carefully at, at, at those different areas. Next slide, please. So we'll have a busy slide, the next one. So I wanted those headlines are the key, the key things to focus on. But we've been looking across all of those areas of how we close that gap at 2 million tonnes a year. It's down there in red, it's just 1.9 million tonnes. Uh, how do we close that gap? And if we implement a whole range of some marginal and some very significant initiatives across the area, we can get there. It is possible to close that gap, but it's far from easy. And there's a lot of things that we could be doing. You'll, you'll pick out there. There's a few big ones you can't really see very clearly on the slide, but the, the big ones are things like uh, transitioning our, our trucks and buses over to, uh, to green alternatives, or uh, for example, greening the grid more broadly. Those are the big things, but there's lots of marginal things and activities that we can all be doing businesses can be doing to, to make that make that transition. Next slide, please. So taking those big themes, uh, we've been doing some feasibility studies, initially doing some triangulation and validation of the data to make sure we've got the target right. We've, got, we've looked at those initiatives in as much detail as we can to see which ones are really potentially viable or valid in our area. And we've been doing feasibility studies on things like that transition to solar or large scale storage, energy storage in the, in the area how retrofitting insulation can have a significant impact, what our EV strategy might be. There's a host of initiatives and feasibilities that we've been looking at in, in some detail, supported by Cranfield University, the local authority, and a number of private sector partners to really drill into what can, what can potentially be achieved. Uh, next slide, please. And the key aim for that is to look forward and see what our strategic options really are for North Northamptonshire. What can really work? What's our future pathway to try to achieve net zero that we know we need to achieve? And there are a number of ways forward that we've got that sort of forecast gap still if we don't do anything and steady state progress. But what if we went really fast? What if we did uh, everything that was on that list and more and we uh, through every resource we possibly could at. We could get there in theory and on paper uh, by the early 2030s. Um, and that's a, a significant potential, but it's also extremely expensive and therefore uh, and, and challenging and, and probably not realistic. You could also go the cheapest route and say, actually, we'll just pick the, the easier to do, the slower, slow burn, pardon the pun, pardon the phrase, um, changes. But there is a strong risk that we just might not get there and it'll be too late to, to pick up the pieces if we, if we, if we start too slowly. Um, we could look and focus in on what we think now are the transformative programmes. Um, the challenge with that is that we might pick the wrong ones. So we've, we've looked at what we're calling a, a risk-adjusted blend of, of options. And if we, can, if we go for that route, then we stand a strong chance of reaching uh, a net zero in North Northamptonshire by the mid to late 2030s, uh, well ahead of the, the target. It's still very challenging to do that. But if we go that route, and even if we don't quite make those sorts of timescale targets, we, we have a, a very strong probability of beating a 2050 target. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And really, this is just a, an explanation of what we mean by a risk adjusted low cost uh, lowest cost approach really it's a case of a, a funnel we start off with a, that vast array of potential projects we could do we pick and look at the good ideas and the potential winners and we start to implement and we see what activity is really working and then we start to pick where more pressure and more opportunity and more 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 in investment could be made to really take us forward uh, more, more quickly and and that allows some of those that are failing to fall away and we focus in on that smaller number of initiatives that can really be, be effective. And resources ultimately we can, can be aimed at the best options at the earliest opportunity, and we can push forward. So we're taking action now, but we're not necessarily closing off opportunities. Uh, and that's really what the risk-adjusted approach is, is, is all about. Next slide, please. Um, 
I'll move through these relatively quickly because, there's a, as I say, there is a vast array of potential initiatives, but here's just some, some highlights under those different headings of buildings, energy, transportation and so forth. So really better buildings is an, is an obvious statement, but really having a program that says better buildings for North Northamptonshire, looking at energy efficiency in those homes, insulation control, also educating people about how to, how to uh, improve their energy efficiency. But installing better systems, switching from fossil fuel to electric is the major thing. Stop burning stuff is the mantra and, uh, and go electric. Um, generate as much electricity and heat as we can near or close to our buildings rather than having to um, centralise our energy production and, and, and have wasteful transmission losses across, across the UK. And a lot of that we can do on existing buildings as well as new buildings, but there's a, a new buildings programme in North Northamptonshire has got a uh, is, is a, a major growth area in the UK and has been for a number of years and will be for the next decade or more. Uh, how can we make sure that that's done in the best possible way? So working hard with, with all of the development partners, including the local authority planners, architects, developers, builders, to improve that net zero literacy, a message that's coming across in many of the presentations today, which I'm pleased, pleased to hear is carbon literacy, people understanding what the challenge is, yes, but what the options for doing, uh, to making change are. Um, so those, those key, key areas, next slide, please. Transport, we've heard from, from Nadine and, and what, what Kia and the highways are, are looking at already. Behind that sits a, look, a real look at EV strategies more generally across the area. Um, people like the council and Kia fleet and others making taking the lead and showing by example what's possible, but putting other initiatives out there for people to, to engage with um, around transition to e-fuels, but but I think fundamentally there are, there are lots of measures around uh, transition on transport which will have a significant impact. Probably the single biggest impact. Some of them are hard to achieve, but lots of smaller ones can can make a contribution. So that's really going to be a strong area as the transport transition. Next slide, please. Our industrial and commercial partners, the private sector predominantly. Uh, looking at ways that both small businesses as well as the large larger businesses can look at how they measure, manage and, and mitigate their carbon emissions, support for small businesses in that area where it's challenging to get the right information or, or understand what they can do. Um, looking at how their supply chains can be improved, um, given that you know 60 to 80 percent of, of the small businesses um, carbon emissions are actually related to the supply chain from who they're buying and who they're who they're utilizing so it's helping them identify that and find ways to improve it and again education and uh, and information uh, understanding how we can help inform businesses on what their their options are but particularly also in north Northamptonshire, looking at how we can help with upskilling for this economic change as well as this uh, um, climate change that's going on how we can ensure that uh, we have the the skills in the area uh, to support that transition next slide please Okay, and uh, food, farming and forestry. Um, really lots of areas of change in here. Consumer behavior is, is a big change in terms of food, uh, um, how we, how we uh, help make that transition. Uh, farming, uh, a big challenge for how we have sustainable farming going forward, where our fertilizer comes from, has a major impact both on the cost of farming, um, but also, how that's produced from fossil fuels in the first place. Forestry, uh, Councillor Pentland has already mentioned, there's a, the, leading the way already in this area in terms of forestry plantation. That's a, another key initiative. So we've been looking at how those can, uh, can make a contribution. Next slide, please. And energy, I mean, that's, that's a, a major area. I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I won't dwell on this particular slide, but the transition on energy is probably the thing that people are most aware of, and particularly in the current climate with, with uh, the cost of energy, that there's a major transition going on at a grid level, but also at uh, local levels and domestic levels at how we can, we can improve this. And so a big part of the program will be supporting that, that activity. Next slide, please. Well, that's going to come together really in developing, you can't see on this slide, but it's to give you an indication that as all these things come together, we've got a, a route map that we're developing of the actions that can be taken over the coming years to get us to that net zero target. 
and on the right hand side the different partners that will be taking a lead or a championing or a supporting or a financing role and so at the end of the program towards the the end of this year we'll identify this route map and show what we can practically be doing to uh, to make this transition next next slide please Along the way, there are significant challenges as we go, making sure, sorry, if you can move it on, thank, thank you. Um, uh, ensuring this transition is just uh, is, a, is a big area. Uh, there's a bit of a hint on the next slide. Um, I, I think uh, making sure that uh, we, we make this a, a just transition. W what is net zero is one of the questions that is still asked. What do we mean? There was one, there was a definition on one of the earlier earlier slides today, but I think a really understanding of what that can mean. So just to give you a practical example, the growth agenda in North Northamptonshire is involving a great, great many new new houses built across the area. Um, but next next slide, please now, Reg. But there is a bit of an elephant in the room and I'm moving on one more. Um, embodied carbon, as we build these new houses, it's not just about the emissions from the energy consumption, but it's actually the embedded carbon in those homes. Next. And actually, that accounts for over 40% of the of the carbon emissions from new development with the operation of those homes only around 4%, which is really important that we tackle that, but it's uh, putting it in proportion. But again, next slide. But there's one more, and ne next again, moving on. And that back back to transport. So 56, the remaining 56% of the trans of the, the emissions come from uh uh, come from the transport of how we get to and from those new homes and that development. So it's a really, really important area that we focus in on, on, on transportation. Next, next slide, please. And again. Yeah. So the scale and speed is a big challenge. How do we do this over the next five to 10 years, ensure that we really get ahead of the game because we're behind it at the moment? Next. And maintaining focus and momentum is a, is a, is a real big challenge. We, we've sort of got a grip. We're getting a grip on what we think we need to do and what we know we need to do. But actually maintaining that focus is going to be a big challenge. Next slide, please. With that in mind, uh, putting up um, with apologies to, to Nadine on, on hydrogen, if I may be clear what I mean by hydrogen as a distraction in certain areas, it's definitely a potential distraction. The biggest challenge we have with hydrogen is how we produce it. At the moment, we don't produce it very cleanly. In fact, 95% of the hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels at the moment, and that's really not sustainable. Um, so we need to identify how we produce that better. But there are key areas, and heavy plant particularly is one area where it will play a part in the future. But it's really important that we don't get distracted by it being the answer to everything, because it absolutely isn't. And it's certainly not necessarily the transition, for example, for domestic heating. It's really, you know, as, as people transition, um, we've got some key key decision points for people as in life and one of those is when the boiler goes and what we don't want necessarily is people confused on what they should transition to and going electric is the answer fundamentally at the moment until we can find a way over the next few decades of producing our hydrogen more, more cleanly for the sake of time I'll move on so I think a bit, really big important thing is now action and we need a collaborative approach to delivery and stewardship. Collaboration is key across public and private sector, identifying the actions and the ongoing program. And that's really what stage two of, of, of North Northampton Net Zero is going to be focused on, how we encourage that behavioral change um, and, uh, and, and make that make that progress. Um, we'll have uh, a digital twin. We'll be sitting there supporting uh, what we're doing and how we can see how the changes that we're making, that, that risk-adjusted review, we can put through what we have as a digital twin looking at the whole of North Northampton to say, if we make this change, then these implicate, these these outcomes will happen. And that's gonna be a really helpful tool to, 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 to take us forward. Funding public sector, private sector, and community funds to help make, make that transition. But last few slides, if we can move on. Well, there is a lot of, uh, of what, what some people call first responder fatigue. We've, we're hearing daily about all of the challenges, all of the initiatives that maybe we've been trying to do. A lot of the people that are at the forefront of this, there's a real danger that we've, we've, we're pushing the message and is it getting through? I think that was something that was coming out of COP27 this last few weeks is we need to move to the actions. What's actually going to be happening? Next slide, please. You know, we've had a lot going into, the, into this bucket around sustainability jargon, jargon events, 
conferences, but the action tap really hasn't been turned on enough. Um, and that's really what we, we need to start to look at. Next slide, please. I think the really important thing for me is that there is a there needs to be a, a really, uh, we must generate a positive vision to encourage that change, as well as talking about the threats and the challenges that we face. We really need to look at, there are some upsides to all of this. There are some positives in terms of a better life that we can achieve for, for ourselves and our children. And that's a, a really important shift this behavioral change. Um, so uh, I think carbon literacy plays, plays an important part in that. Um, and so, sorry, next slide, please, Judge. So I think looking at the sort of the upsides of, of this transition around economic health and, and, and social benefits, there are a great many jobs that can be created, new businesses that can be created as we meet the challenges of, of this transition. You know, simply a, a achieving a, an a just energy transition will reduce people's energy bills in the medium to long term. We'll have a healthier environment. We'll have closer co cooperation as we come together to try and meet these challenges. Energy resilience is obviously on people's minds. That, that will come too if we make this transition. Um, better transport options, lower cost uh, uh, options, I think is, is really important. So it's, it's, I think it's key that we have a positive message to go along with the challenges that we know we face. We won't get the engagement. People will stand back and be looking for the silver bullet for somebody in government to solve our challenges. And if we don't put out the positive message of how everybody can engage, I think that's really going to be our, uh, our challenge. Unfortunately, um, government is, is starting to, to, to recognise that and put support around it. So next slide, please, the last couple of slides. Now, this just identifies what some what, what individuals can do. And this is this this is the top 10 things that we can all do. And I think um, you know, living car free uh, is, is the single biggest thing. It's, it's a challenge for many and, and not achievable for, for most necessarily at the moment. But it's uh, as we build new places and better places, if we can build them in a way that requires much less car transport than uh, you know, Nadine's tree of, of, of travel options, I think comes more realistic and, uh, and more of an option. But if we can't get rid of the car, then we should move to electric vehicles. Um, and we should also look at the flights we take. If we take one less flight, that's equivalent. One less long haul flight is equivalent to an annual carbon emissions of a, of a, of a Western individual. Get rid of one flight and we can make a, a significant difference. Those transitions to renewable energy, if we can do it at home, those that can afford to do it should be doing it, should be encouraged to do it. We, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the wealthiest 10% in, the, in, in, in our area uh, have four times the emissions of the, the least well off in our area. And we have, a, I think, a duty to try and make that transition if we can do it. So there's a host of things that we can be doing. Um, we don't need to do 100% of all these things, but if we can do something across this area, there's lots of action that we can be taking as individuals. And I think the more information we can put out there about how this leads to a healthier lifestyle and a lower cost lifestyle will help people make that transition. Um, one more slide. And if I could sort of put one message out and there's one more little bit there to that one, Raj. Move on again. There we go. It's be an informed customer. I think if we can do anything is educate ourselves. Um, and we, the, the buying decisions that we make as individuals, it's just like every vote counts, every decision counts. If we can make um, individual buying decisions, we can start to influence uh, how businesses um, buy things, where they come from, what the carbon footprint we have as, as consumers. I hate that phrase consumers, but anyway, because that implies we're doing lots of it and we need to reduce the amount that we do. But that uh, we can have a significant climate uh, impact if we make those decisions and carbon literacy is really important informing people of, of, of what they're what they can be doing is is really key uh final final slide i think Raj. so as i say we've, we've got this program going on um but do please stay stay engaged if you do have ideas go to our website go to nn to nz and pop in your idea into the box tell us what you think Tell us what you think generally, because it's great to hear and engage and understand the challenges people are facing. So please do, do engage with that. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick, for going through that. And it's a fascinating um, and really innovative project that is going on. And I'm really pleased that the council is involved with that, that 
just to, to gain the knowledge that you guys have got in all of this. It's really good to hear what a good response you've had to the call for ideas um, and the outcomes for that will be um, really useful for the council moving forward. So a quick thank you there to our speakers um, for going through all that information for us today. Um, some really useful bits to take away from all of that. We're going to move to some questions now, which people have been emailing in across the course of that session. And I'm going to hand over to George Candler, who is our Executive Director for Place and Economy, to take us through that. Thank you, Councillor Pentland, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, as Councillor Pentland said, my name is George Candler. I'm Executive Director for Place and Economy here at North Northamptonshire Council. And I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, that first session. So again, thank you um, to Janet, Nick um, uh, and Nadine uh, for that. Um, we have had some questions, um, both um, through the YouTube channel, which is great. Uh, we've also had some sent in advance as well. Uh, what we will be doing, I'm just mindful uh, that this session uh, finishes at uh, 11 o'clock. Those questions that we're not aren't, uh, able to pose um, this morning, we will be capturing, uh, we will be responding to them, and we will be posting them on the website. Uh, so if you search uh, climate change, on the North Northamptonshire website, um, you'll find all the details of this conference and we'll also put the questions up there uh, as well. So moving on, um, I think we've got time for about three questions all being well. Um, so the first one I'm gonna to pose to yourself, uh, Janet, um, which we had a lot of responses uh, to your presentation, uh, clearly thoroughly enjoyed by those people watching. Um, the question posed is, what do we as a council and more broadly as residents and businesses need to be doing to assist uh, biodiversity across North Northamptonshire? Um, and in particular with the Environment Act not fully coming in until next year, how can we best prepare for that? Okay, um, well, one of the things I didn't mention um, is the use of herbicides. Um, and I think, that is something we do need to look at in terms of large um, contracts, you know, such as Kia is doing large areas of, of management at landscape level, but local authorities too. And even in our gardens, using things like slug pellets, um, using glyphosate, and these are known to not be very good for the environment. And, you know, they, they potentially have an effect on human health, but it's been shown to have effect on um, amphibians and and you know other organisms. So uh, I say you know just think about um, letting things look a bit untidy. Yeah, try not to cut everything, tidy everything up. Um, particularly this time of year, hedgehogs are looking places to overwinter. Insects will overwinter in leaf piles. Um, so it's, it's just really about changing our behaviours, really, rather than having a nice green mown lawn or a bit of astro turf, God forbid. Um, just allow the garden to, to rest over the winter, let organisms, you know, hibernate and, and get ready for next year. So that's one thing. And also, the, you know, the chemicals you're introducing. There are some alternative sub pellets available now which is phosphate-based, and it, it breaks down into a fertiliser. So that'd be my one, my one message. But there's lots we can do. Lots of organisations like the RSPB, Wildlife Trust, um, even the government websites have lots of ideas about helping wildlife. Feeding birds, for instance. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and, and actually we did have... Um a related question around that so it's it's really helpful actually um janet that you've you've woven that in with regards to pesticides and herbicides so uh um uh thank you for that and, and, I, and I think you're right there I, are sorry janet can i just ask as an um, ad as well is that you know if we if we cut highways for instance so that it's safe for road users but leave the rest of the the grass or vegetation grow it actually save um people money 
Well, that's a perfect segue actually into the second question, which I'm going to um, pose to Nadine, if I may, um, uh, which which is is very much linked to that, uh, Nadine, which is how do we balance the drive um, around um, increasing pollination and pollinate, pollination working um, with Kia, um, but at the same time ensure that visibility on certain roads is maintained for safety reasons, i.e. near roundabouts and junctions. So I think I think we all recognise it's a it's a fine balancing act. But did, have you got a view on that, Nadine? Yeah. So um, obviously we have to always think about safety first. So visibility cuts will always be carried out on junctions, roundabouts, etc. Um, but we um, we do have protected verges around the county that we work with the Wildlife Trust on, and we are looking to increase those and increase the both the length and the, the number of them to increase pollinators um, and biodiversity in general. Um, and we're, we're also going to be looking at our, the, the cutting regimes because as Janet says, you know, cutting less will ultimately cost less, um, but it, it's something we need to look at in, in the wider picture. Um, we, we also carry out environmental assessments on all of our projects and um, biodiversity is always considered as part of that. So what biodiversity improvements we can implement on schemes and projects. Great. No, thanks, Nadine. I, I think um, I think it's something that, uh, as a, as a local authority, we're we're keen to do more of. And mm -hmm. and uh, I think um, as Councillor Pen Pentland mentioned at the right at the very beginning, you know, the work that we have been doing around our um, pollinator schemes and the pollinator strategy that we've now got in place. Yeah. Uh, demonstrates that commitment but as always and, and quite rightly there's a, there's always uh, a drive to do more and that's something that we're, we're certainly at proactively uh, looking at as a, as a local authority particularly as we with key manage our um, highways network mm -hmm. and balancing that with with the safety element that uh, the question quite quite rightly um, quite rightly pose um, question for Nick uh, if I may uh, Nick um, so I've had questions around um, um, the, the the sort of drive, you know, we're in a high growth area, North Northamptonshire, which is very positive, um, both in terms of um, generating jobs uh, and, and obviously generating housing. But how do we and what considerations do we need to be giving to balance that sustainable growth alongside uh, a sustainable environment across North Northamptonshire? Yeah, um, that, that is a, a major challenge and opportunity in in the same breath for us i think how we build those new homes and those new businesses physically is really important i mentioned that elephant in the room around embedded carbon really focusing on how much concrete we put down uh how much tarmac we put down whether we need to put it everywhere um, i think that that comes back to those physical choices on materials but it also comes around policy in building that designing those places to be as transport free as possible or certainly with modal shift opportunities so we we're not always reliant on on the car to get everywhere and that's about place design as much as how we build it as well physically um so i think that those those are key key areas really i think that are going to make a difference the energy that we use and how so electrify everything is again a mantra let's not build another house with a gas boiler in it um, let's not when we when we're designing a new the, all the big big uh, warehousing sheds going up. Many of them now are starting to have solar on the roof. Thankfully, more of them, all of them need to do that so they're energy independent or at least making a net contribution. Those are ways that we can can mitigate it. But uh, choice of materials is probably one of the biggest things that we can we can do. It's a quick answer, doesn't it? Make it. Make it. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it's. I think it's going to be. It, it is a balance. Um, I think it's fair to say, and and I think um, how we get that balance right um, is is key. And and obviously, some of that is driven through national policy, and some of it uh, can also be driven through local policy. So um, I think it's an evolving piece. Certainly, that North Northamptonshire Council is developing its next long-term strategic plan around both um, identifying employment land and housing land. And again, we want to ensure that the work, particularly through the um, North North Hans to Net Zero report, can help feed into that and help shape some of those um, policies that we look to develop over the next, over the next few months uh, and years. Probably got time for one more um, quick 
quick question um and probably uh, go back to N nadine and and to nick just for this final question um and uh because uh, hydrogen was mentioned in both presentations <laughs> and, and nick uh, diplomatically caveated his his slide i suppose that the, the question posed is is hydrogen the answer for heavier vehicles um we know that uh, 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 heavier vehicles um, in very basic terms, require more battery uh, batteries on board, which creates the, which basically means the built the vehicles are heavier still and don't, can't necessarily travel as far. But is hydrogen the answer for heavier vehicles, such as refuse vehicles, or will technology, building on your point, Nick, continue to evolve to enable electric or any other form of green energy fuel to evolve and 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 replace that that alternative so I'll probably pose that to you nick and then let nadine have the final word if i may yep absolutely i think the answer is it's it's part of the answer it's not the answer i think uh, as i said really how we generate this hydrogen in the first place is really a key factor in terms of whether it's really having a net, a net positive benefit for us I think technology is in, is improving. Nadine's will probably talk about HBO again. I think e fuels play, I think, as big a factor as as hydrogen can play in terms of uh, of that transition. In the meantime, while the technologies are improving and they're improving all the time, energy density in batteries is improving all the time. Cleverer ways of having powered trailers as well as powered tractor vehicles in terms of transport is coming along. So that that challenge of of, of carrying those batteries around with you. Those, there's, there's lots of improvements. We shouldn't be waiting for them. We need to um, do what we can in the short term, but I think e-fuel is probably a bigger play than, than hydrogen in my mind. That's that's my view. Sorry, Nadine, I'll give you, <laughs> over to you. No, no, you're absolutely right about the hydrogen. And um, we would only be looking at green hydrogen from renewable energies, um, which at the moment is obviously a, a very small percentage of the hydrogen that's produced uh, in total um, which is why we've got sort of stepping stone approach to you know how we'll get there and our our approach to zero uh, car carbon emissions is is very flexible you know with the new technologies coming on board we, we're um, open to to looking at those as well so Looking Brilliant. to change course whenever, wherever needed. It's not set in stone. It's just a, an approach at the moment. I think that's that's the key message: is we need, we need a flexible, adjustable yeah. approach as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the key thing is is we are looking to change <coughs> and move away from um, carbon emitting um, vehicles to to those that are far more uh, sustainable and and uh, and more. Uh, gentler on the climate per se, but also on people's well-being, et cetera. You know, we had questions around, um, you know, us being at the sort of centre of logistics in North Northamptonshire and the throughput of traffic, which we, we haven't got time to, to cover today. We had questions um, on that as well, also around what role technology can play um, in terms of sustainability. So what we'll do is we'll post all of these questions um, up onto our website, we'll get answers to them as well. We may need to to go back to our our three guest speakers uh, this morning as well to to help provide some of those answers. But can I just take uh, a, a final opportunity to thank Dr. Janet Jackson, uh, Nadine Alana, and Nick Bolton uh, for their three presentations and being uh, put on the spot uh, with regards to um, the questions. Um, this concludes the first of our three sessions um, this morning. Um, do tune in. Our next session starts at uh, eleven thirty on the YouTube channel, and again, the details are on our uh, website, uh, where we've got four uh, presentations focused around sustainability uh, and nature recovery, the way ahead. So that will start at eleven thirty a.m. Uh, and run through to one o'clock. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much uh, for watching, uh, and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.